fellow friends. Happy Sunday. I don't know about you. Um, I know that my my calendar back here says keep on the sunny side of life, uh, but I think it's been a little bit too sunny recently. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I um, have not wanted to be outside very much, especially in the middle part of the day. As a person who has been living in California, uh, pretty close to the beach for five years, um, I think that I've become actually quite a bit of a, a, a wimp when it comes to um, both hot and cold weather. Um, and so here in this, in this moment, um, I'm feeling very blessed to have a roof over my head, uh, to have an air conditioning vent uh, down by my feet, um, to be protected from the elements of this Oklahoma weather um, and this, this heat wave that is setting up over uh, much of the South. I feel blessed, furthermore, um, to have a wife that loves me. I feel blessed to have two puppies that I love. Um, I feel blessed to have my health in a time when so many are experiencing incredible sickness. But every time that I feel blessed and every time that I use that word to describe how I feel, and it, it is truly how I feel, I always start to wonder, what about, what about the people who don't have a roof over their head and an air conditioning vent by their feet, who are homeless or exposed to the elements? Are those people somehow not blessed? What about those who have lost loved ones and don't have a spouse that they love? Are, are those people somehow not blessed? What about those who are sick and who are dying during this time? What about them? Are they not blessed? Does God not love them? Let's hear these words from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 through 31. Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place, with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out of him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, 
do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On April 15th, 1912, an ocean liner called the Titanic grazed an iceberg and began taking on water. The crew took the precaution of loading some passengers, I think you know which ones, into lifeboats and lowering them into freezing waters. Did you know that, that only 20 lifeboats made it to the water? And, and to make uh, matters worse, most of them were less than half full, with room for many more people. And despite later pleas for help from hundreds more passengers who ended up in the deadly ice-cold waters, most of the lifeboat crews were afraid to return. Ultimately, with nearly 1,500 people dying in the water and seeking rescue, the rowboats rowed away. But one boat, one boat was an exception. As it turns out, the officer of lifeboat number 14 Harold Lowe, did what none of the other officers did. He knew that he had to respond. So he managed to get some other boats to take on all of his passengers. And then he returned by himself with his empty lifeboat to the sinking ship to pick up survivors. He knew that he couldn't save them all, but he could save some. Over the last two weeks, the sermons have revolved around God's promises to God's children, as revealed in the covenant that God made with Abraham in the book of Genesis. The first promise is that God will guide you home, which, uh, to be honest, really isn't that hard for God, um, because God God is our home, um, and we, we help bring that home into the world by becoming the church, the family of God, which I have personally experienced um, in the warm welcome uh, that this church has has given uh, to me and my wife as we um, have become part of this faith community, um, this, this family, and um, as we've returned to Oklahoma. The second promise is that God will make us fruitful, that we will bear fruit in our lives through the grace of God that is always present, helping us to grow in our love for God, for creation, for neighbor, and self. The third promise, the subject of today's reflection, is that God will make us to be a blessing. To be a blessing. I'd wager that uh, that phrase itself is a little bit strange to most people's ears uh, just to begin with. The phrase, count your blessings, uh, which my grandma used to say to me um, over and over again, uh, doesn't really ask us to, to count up all of the blessings that we have given, um, or even more to count up all of the blessings that we have been, uh, but rather the blessings that we have received, um, the blessings that, that we have. And yet, in God's promise to Abraham, God clearly says, you will be a blessing. God says, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And this promise, this promise that God makes here, um, has, of course, in one way, already come to pass. Through the descendants of Abraham, a Jewish rabbi opened up the gift of salvation to all people through his life, his death, and resurrection. 
And that man, Jesus, called the Christ, once gave the sermon that, uh, that I just read um, from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, and it's in this, this sermon that he talks about blessings. He talks about blessings and woes. And so I'm, I'm going to read it again. Uh, but this time when I read it, I'm going to pair up the blessing statements uh, with their corresponding woe statement so that we can hear these words in a, in a new light. So let's hear these words of Jesus Christ one more time. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. But woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. But woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. But woe to you when all speak well of you. Uh, this is not the prosperity gospel. Um, that's, that is for sure. Uh, this is, I think, as Jesus says in the fourth chapter of Luke, verse 18, the gospel to the poor. These words of Jesus, just literally all, every single one of these words, Jesus' words, I think it are, are often um, viewed as being just too divisive. Why would someone even read these words? Uh, they, they only divide us. They are too confrontational. Um, the, the response is often people shirking away from what they might mean. Um, because, frankly, it, it challenges. Uh, it challenges us as Christians. It challenges the society, the world that we live in. Um, it asks us to change who we view as holy, who we think is worthy of love, care, and compassion. Jesus is saying that if you want to find God, don't look in a mansion, don't look in the White House, don't look in Hollywood. Go out and be with the poor, the hungry, the mourning, the people that this world, uh, this world despises, because that's where you're going to find God. The downtrodden are never far from God, because God is, is never far from the downtrodden. Jesus I think, blesses us by, by turning all of our assumptions upside down. And so, why is that a blessing to us? Well, you know, contrary to popular opinion, worldly wisdom, um, prosperity is, is not a sign of God's blessing or favor. Um, and and th that's good news to for us, because we are not always going to be those who have prosperity. Tragedy will befall us. It, it surely has befallen each one of us. It is now befalling our nation, and it will befall us in the future. All of us will face tragedy in our lives. And because tragedy, uh, because prosperity is not a sign of God's blessing or favor, when we experience tragedy, we can, um, we can rest assured that that God loves us, that God suffers with us, um, that God is is with us, and that God is for us always. Jesus reminds us that that all we have in life. Um, our possessions, our health, even our lives are, are here today and on tomorrow. If you are hungry now, you can be fed tomorrow. If you are fed now, you can be hungry tomorrow. 
the world is topsy turvy already, and and if COVID nineteen has has taught us anything, it's that that nothing is guaranteed. We could be rich today, poor tomorrow. We could be rejoicing today, and mourning tomorrow. We could have um, the favor of others. We could we could be well regarded today and and scorned tomorrow. And into this discussion, Jesus says what are perhaps his most quoted um, and most famous words. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For Jesus and his followers, uh, this, the golden rule, is what it means to be a blessing in this topsy-turvy world. It means give as generously as you would hope to receive if you were in need. If the situation were reversed, if this world were turned upside down. Now going back to the Titanic. There's a church in Colorado that has made lifeboat number 14 its defining image. And although they care about the people who are in the boat, who are part of their church, who are part of the faith, they're even more concerned with reaching those who are still dying out in the icy waters of life around them. Realizing that the life that God has blessed them with is intended to allow them to bless, to bless others, they are focused outward on the last, the least, and, and the lost. And this, this is always a risk when we turn outward, when we, when we change our posture from inward focus to outward focus, when we start to live into God's promise for us that we will be a blessing to the world, that we will be a blessing here um, to, to Enid, that we will be a blessing to Oklahoma, that we will be a blessing to our nation and to all nations of the world. It's a risk. Just as Harold Lowe knew that to return to the Titanic meant that his boat might be swarmed, that he might himself be thrown into the water, he also knew that if fortune had been reversed, if he'd been in the water and, and another had been on the boat, that he'd want that person to come to his rescue. And so I wonder today, who is waiting for us to come to the rescue? And what might be holding us back from being the blessing that God promises that we will be? You know, I think that for most lifeboat captains, that faithful, fateful night, what, what held them back was, was well, well, fear, of course, it was fear of being swarmed um, by people scrambling to climb into the boats. Um, maybe fear of the, the rough waters that were created by the, um, the in intense undertow of a giant sinking ship. But I think that, honestly, for most of us, most of the time, it isn't fear that holds us back, but it's that we, we don't properly appreciate the blessings that we have received. It's actually, I think, a lack of gratitude. You see, generosity begins in gratitude. Gratitude for what we have. Gratitude dispels the myth that we don't have enough to share. Gratitude teaches us to be content so that we don't have to believe the lie that we need to um, accumulate or buy more things in order to be happy. Gratitude helps us to realize that the blessings that we have, the blessings that we have received, are ultimately the gifts of God. 
gratitude, I think, helps us to recognize that our lifeboats aren't too small to help put others on. So we are blessed to be a blessing. And although we, we can't help, we, we, we certainly can't help everyone. Only, only one person uh, can save everyone. And, and through that person, we've already received salvation. We still all have gifts to offer. And so God has, God has blessed us. And through the promises of God, we will be a blessing. We'll be a blessing to Enid. We will be a blessing to Oklahoma. We will be a blessing to our nation and to all the nations of the earth. Let it be so. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this day, and we offer our gratitude for all of the blessings that you have placed in our lives. Whether we have much or we have little, um, help us to appreciate what we do have, to recognize that it comes from you um, and that you have given it to us so that we might um, be a blessing to others. And help us to see that our, our lifeboats, um, the, the things that we have, the um, blessings that we have received, our gifts, our talents, our possessions, are a lifeboat for others. And that that lifeboat is not too small. God, as we go throughout these days, let us be mindful of those who are suffering. That we might do unto them what they would have us, um, what, what we would have them uh, do unto us. God, we give you thanks, ultimately, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the ultimate savior, savior who has given us everything uh, that we could possibly need. Help us to experience and live into his love that we might be able to extend that love, uh, the blessing of that love to others. Go.